Hey, I'm Eric Rokic with fitnessbusinessinterviews.com, and today I am here with Jeff Cavalier, who for three years was the head physical therapist and strength coach for the New York Mets. He's been voted one of the top 50 trainers in the USA by Men's Fitness Magazine, but today we're here to talk about the business side of things with Jeff and how he's been able to take some few programs, good partnerships, and turn it into a really successful business. So, Jeff, thanks very much for being here. I really appreciate the time. Thank you for having me. I'm glad to be here. All right, so I always like to kind of start off, find out a little bit of information so we can give a little background um, so people can understand who you are and what's going on. So let's back up. Let's tell me a little bit about how you got started in the industry in the early days for you. Um, well, I, I, you know, the really the uh, involvement into the online industry started just uh, kind of being an entrepreneur. I've always sort of had that entrepreneurial spirit. I think even back in the in the day when I was doing some caddying at a, at a golf course, I would, you know, I figured out if you could carry two bags, you can you can make more money, you know, with with two bags than you could one. So, you know, I always wanted to figure out ways that um, I could help people, but at the same time help more people, you know, mm -hmm. at, at once. So when I went to PT school, the idea of being in a practice um, and working in a clinic was not what appealed to me. Even from the very, very beginning, I figured that's only one patient per a certain amount of, you know, hours in the day, um, in a very small centric you know, lo location. So I, uh, I decided that I wanted to branch out if there was a way I could. So shortly after being, um, uh, you know, graduating, coming into a PT clinic, I, uh, I just kept open two days for myself, Tuesdays and Thursdays, so I could do some training that had, you know, uh, a strong sense of physical therapy um, uh, involved in it. So either an athlete, I always catered towards athletes if I could, but you know, in a clinic you don't get to select who you work with, you know. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to find guys that had issues that were, you know, preventing them from playing uh, either at all because they were, you know, completely on the shelf or not playing up to their capabilities because they were sort of nagging injuries. Um, and I would just take on clients for personal training that way. Um, I literally started with one person on Tuesdays and Thursdays, and I kept the entire day off to myself, you know, with the hope that I would build that up eventually to fill those days. So I could say it was some pretty uh, boring, long days to have just one person for an hour out of the entire day. Um, but I kind of stuck to my guns not wanting to fill up those days or do part-time in the clinic because I knew that if I was part-time on those Tuesdays and Thursdays, I wouldn't be out there doing the things that need to be done, and we can talk about those things, but the things that need to be done in order to grow the practice and right. fill it up, as opposed to just going to work every day. All right, well, let's talk about those things, because um, you were into it, you were on Tuesdays and Thursdays part-time, just that one hour each yeah. day. You obviously had to do something, well, so what were you doing? Yeah. Uh, well, you know, I always sort of you know, made it a point to do, I always think that even today, you know, I, I still try to do one thing that I can do to sort of advance the business from where it was the day before. Right. Um, I feel as if I accomplish something if I can do just one thing that advances it prior to the day before. So for me, it was all about sort of making contacts and and and, uh, and knocking down some doors and and you know branching out into areas that maybe I wasn't uh, naturally gifted for, but could get better at with time. So one of those things was writing. Um, I actually think that I'm not a bad writer, but I think what makes me a bad writer is the slowness of which I can create stuff on paper. I, I have a, um, I think one, it's all said and done, the written word looks good, and people would be like, wow, this is a good article. But if they knew that it took me, you know, three weeks to write it, they'd probably say, well, it's not so great. You know, you can't crank those out so quick. So I worked on sort of practicing that. And what I would do is, um, you know, try to contact different, um, you know, publications that I could write for, whether they be newspapers, whether it be, uh, um, you know, a little bit more ambitious uh, golf magazine. I went and I asked them if they would take some submissions on golf fitness. Mm. Um, golf fitness had always been sort of, you know, a love of mine. I like the, I like the game, and as I told you, I caddied. I mean, I've always been around the game, so I started off with that sort of as my focus, um, and I just tried to. Uh, reach a little bit beyond what I probably should have been. So I, I went to uh, Golf Magazine and I actually just pretty much showed up one day in New York City and I asked them if, if uh, they needed any writers on Golf Fitness. And I tried to show my credentials as a physical therapist and see if that helped. And unfortunately it wasn't really enough because they have their own uh, freelance writers already and right. they don't accept outside submissions and stuff. 
So then I went back home and then I prepared something that I thought was really unique, like one article that I thought was unique from everything. Again, here's one other thing. Spend that time researching what it is that you want to do. So if you want to write for a golf magazine, research what their magazine already features for the last mm -hmm. year or so and see, well, what is it that they're not doing that you can automatically automatically position yourself as unique to what they've, what they've offered? And that's what I did. I did a, a, a rotator cuff stretch with the golf club, sort of combined into a posterior left shoulder stretch, like all in one. And it was definitely unique. And the woman was like, wow, I've never seen this before. So we might have to run this. And that was it. And it, they, they literally, they, they took a chance. They, wrote, they, they ran the article for me. And because I had what was called clips, I didn't even know what that was at the time. I was asked by one magazine, can I have your clips, please? And I was like, I don't even know what a clip is. Right. And it, it, it's, a, it's other things that you've been published in. So oh, okay. like other, other sort of publicated clips that you have that you can show to a, a magazine and say, here's my stuff. Mm -hmm. It gave me the all-important clip because that's what you, you have to have those if you're going to get into a magazine. Right. So, so I happened to get lucky and got a break from them that then I was able to accumulate some clips to bring to other magazines like Men's Fitness and say, here's how I, you know, here's some of the stuff I've done. And then, there, it, you know, if you've been published in one, you could be published in another, that type of thing. So then it becomes easier and easier. But that's just one example. Like, I, I you know, so what, what went into that? Taking the day to go to New York City on my own just to go see what would, you know, what would happen. Um, coming back and working on that, you know, developing that idea and that stretch so that I could actually present something different. Um, researching the magazine itself to figure out what is it that they did need so that was probably step two you know uh, and then step three would have been actually going back down and presenting it again and staying on top of that to make sure that you know um, that was it now it's not I can't say it was all like you know hard work one of the other things was that I I, I, uh, uh, I had partnered up with one of the uh, a baseball player for the New York Mets um, in this time. Again, one of the things I wanted to do was not be in the clinic, so I, I started a, a small group training. I know that you sort of like the whole group training uh, aspect, and, and especially with athletes. It worked well with AAU baseball players. I wanted to do a, a, a group class during a time that I was, I think it was up in, uh, God, it was about, it was like, uh, you know, probably 30 minutes away from me. I can't remember the town, but it was this indoor, indoor sports bubble, and, and I would go up there and one of the Mets guys was hitting in there because his his wife lived in that area mm -hmm. all the season. So he was hitting in there, saw that I was doing training for baseball players and just sort of came up to me and said, do you do this individually for, you know, for individual guys? And I happened to know who he was because I was a Met fan at the time. Um, so part of this sort of day-to-day, -day, Tuesday, Thursday, you know, uh, work day of an hour was driving down to, after training him for an offseason, dri driving down to Shea Stadium to watch him play and support him. Now, I know it mm. sounds crazy, but literally he was a, a bench player that act, you know, was getting his first opportunity to, to, to sort of break into the, the major leagues. And just me kind of showing up and, and you know meeting him before the game and you know being there, he knew that I cared about the training that we did all offseason. He knew that mm. I was as invested in, his performance and how he did because I cared about what we went through and what we what we did. So there were days that I literally drove down to the stadium to pick up the tickets that he left for me because I didn't want to go to the game, but I didn't want him to find out that he left tickets and I didn't and I didn't go to the game. Mm, okay. So you know now is it productive that day? No, but it was productive for establishing a relationship with him, who then went on to give me a great endorsement to the New York Mets when the position became available. So. The little things that you can do each day are going to add up later on down the road to have an impact if you can do them, but you have to do them. Okay, now you had this, you were in the practice, you know, you went from that one person day, you were doing all these things, were they having a direct result, were you actually starting to bring in more and more people into the practice? Yeah, well that, yeah, I mean, when I started with one, I mean, the best thing was word of mouth, right, so I yeah. worked with this one guy, and he started to see results, he's an older gentleman too, and he started to see results right away and he started to tell his buddies he was a golfer so he started to tell his buddies who he plays with i mean it's a natural circle of friends that he's playing with and in contact with and guys that can see his improvement you know from week to week mm -hmm. so it was pretty easy because they were able to start asking him questions he gave my name out and then all of a sudden now i had two more people to see on tuesdays and thursdays um from the clinic itself, still being in the clinic, I was able to see patients there, and then they would ask and say, "Hey, you know, I would, I would love if there was some kind of a service where 
I could continue to do what I was doing here for my rehab to try to, you know, make sure that this stuff doesn't come back. You know, do you guys offer this? And the, the clinic I worked at didn't have that kind of service, but if you were willing to do it sort of on a training level, you could. And the great thing about that was there was this continuity between the patient, so you know them as a patient, you know everything that they went through, you knew where they came from from a rehab perspective. So, you know, you're very familiar with where they need to continue to go after that. Um, so I even picked up a couple uh, people from there. And, again, if I hadn't, the biggest thing I did right, I think, was that I that I started off with that entire day open. You know, had I said that I'm going to go to the clinic from 12 to 5, you know, and I'll leave my mornings open. You and I know that as soon as it becomes time, you know, 12 o'clock comes around, you got to go to the clinic. You're shutting down mm-hmm. business from building. You, you can't because you have to attend to what you're doing there. Now, as I said, you could pick up new clients, but what do you do then? We say, well, all I've got is nine to, you know, eight o'clock in the morning until 11 o'clock, you know, before I go into the clinic. You fill up three spots and now you can't take any more anyway. So what is the point? You know, so mm-hmm. having that, giving yourself that room to fill up um, was key for me to be able to you know to continue to build the business I think and what did I do after I got Tuesdays and Thursdays full I started to back off on Wednesdays Monday Wednesday Friday and then that's how it continued to grow so okay. I had to go through that phase twice you know then Monday Wednesday Friday were completely open so I had to okay. go through that what did it end up growing to um, seven days a week <laughs> you know it, it got a little bit out of hand but um, I would basically work from six o'clock in the morning um, to around uh, 8.30 at night, you know, Monday, Wednesday, or Monday through Friday. And then uh, Saturday, I would work from around 9 in the morning until about 2 in the afternoon. And Sundays, I would probably do about the same, 9 to 2. So, you know, it, it just grew because I had people that needed to be seen. And, you know, I, I didn't have the available spots anymore in the, in the uh, weekday. So I had to continue to start branching out into the weekends. Right about when the Mets uh, opportunity came about, I, I was at you know at sort of peak capacity there through the week. Okay, so what ended up happening with the business? Uh, well, you know, I, I was fortunate to have a lot of people like really good people that I became close with. You know, as you as you work with somebody and train somebody, you know, you especially as a physical therapist too, when you're working with them in in when they're hurt, you know, you sort of build up this bond with them that you know that they feel strongly with you that you've helped them get through their tough times. So. Um, I feel like they sort of returned the favor to me. You know, um, when I left, I was I had to tell them what the opportunity was for me and to explain to them why I felt like it would be a good thing for me to do. I felt like I was abandoning everybody. I really did. It was a tough thing for me to do. But and I and I, I briefly discussed with you before that I um, I really feel like it, there was a slight part of me that was like ah. Maybe I don't need to really go take this job, you know, and actually just stay with what I'm doing. My people like me. I, I like what I'm doing, and that's that. But the, the pull was too much, you know. It's such a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. I figured I would do it. But I did. I felt like I was abandoning people at the time. Um, so after I left, it was, I was shocked that when I came back in the off-seasons, just, you know, sort of hanging around in the off-seasons, we, you know, we were done, you know, basically November to, say, February, um, I uh, – I, I had people that I could still see. You know, I just said, "Hey, I'm back in the area. Anybody that's interested?" And a lot of people came right back. So the, the practice never truly died until you know, uh, I would say recently now, because um, you know, this other stuff that I've been doing has sort of grown to the point where I just can't, I can't do two things in right. one day. Right. And you were talking about before, in case people weren't sure, is you'd basically left the clinic to go work for the Mets, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. 2006. Um, the 2006, seven, and eight seasons is when I was there. Okay, and you, I mean, you talked about it before. You had some, you know, some good word of mouth and things to help recommend you to get into that position. Was it offered to you, or was it something that you applied for? Um, it was something that I was made uh, aware of again through the, the player that I had trained before. Um, that they were that their their current physical therapist had moved on to um, mm-hmm. Texas Rangers, so that there was an opening. Um, for that, and they were looking for people. Um, okay. It was really an internal search at the time because okay. they had a couple people that were sort of positioned in the um, in the minor leagues, and they had a couple people that had already done affiliations with them and, and were affiliated through their hospital. So, you know, it just sort of became something where I threw my hat in, in the ring and um, 
the way that all went down, I just went down to a mini camp in January um, where they basically, you know, they have invited players to come in. If we had any new acquisitions at the time, they would come in just to be seen for the first time, you know, because no one's really been thinking about baseball from November, December, or January. So they would come in, and at the same time, anybody that had, uh, they're currently on the roster that was hurt would come in because it would give you a, a one month head start just to see where they're at with rehab so that if anything was off track, they could you know do something about it to get them ready by the time we rolled into spring training a month later. So that was the purpose of minicamp. But for me, it was really an audition. I was there to go down and they kind of threw me in different environments with the players mm-hmm. um, and, and to see how I would react and if I was a good fit. And, um, and luckily I did all right. And I, and I got that position. So, uh, but it came extremely fast. I mean, it was like a, you know, it was like a whirlwind that that month, month and a half that it all happened. Okay. Now, you went from working a ton of hours in the clinic, doing your thing with the patients there, right, to now all of a sudden, you know, being full time with these guys. What was the life like? Your lifestyle like once you were on board with the Mets? I mean, were you traveling with them everywhere? What was that like? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Full travel, everything. I mean. Um, w- I've never worked as many hours in a day or at least, you know, uh, been at a job for as many hours of a day you know, that I was with the Mets because, you know, you on a typical night game, you know, seven o'clock at night, you know, we uh, we show up at 12 o'clock, you know, at the stadium. Um, we have our meetings and stuff from a medical staff standpoint, um, go over some things, go over players that might need special attention that day. Um Guys start rolling in. Some guys like to work out earlier in the day. Other guys like, like to work out later. So you know, you're already. You know, I also had a, a role as an assistant strength coach there too. So mm-hmm. again, extended my day in different ways. We were doing sort of more strength focused at that time. And then guys that are doing their rehab would come through, and we'd go out for team stretch at four o'clock. And you know, it, there was always something to do. But then, you know, now you have the game starting at seven. That could be three and a half hours. You know, sometimes three hours, three and a half hours. You're you're done at eleven o'clock. Then guys, some guys like to come in and work out, you know, because they like to, they'd rather work out after the game so they don't tire themselves out before. And now you're looking at, you know, sometimes midnight and then, you know, go do it all over again. Now, if we were traveling, it's the same. We were just like one of the players. We would, you know, travel with the team on the plane to the hotel, stay, you know, we, we do exactly what they do except a little bit longer hours because they don't have to show up to the park until like two or three. So, um, you know, it was, it was long, but, it was fun. I mean, and the guys, I mean, I don't think I've ever had more fun at a job. You know, the guys make it fun. So everyone's sort of laughing. You're playing a kid's game. So it's not that, um, you know, it's not that stressful that way. But it's always stressful, of course, to, to have to, um, you know, work with those guys, and protect those investments. You know, because yeah. that is, you know, their job is to uh, perform. And if they're not out there, then, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's on you. So that, but I never felt that kind of pressure. I actually liked that. And I never felt that kind of pressure. So for me, the more pressure came from whether the team was winning or losing, you know, that's kind of what drove me crazy. Probably gave me a few gray hairs in those three years that I was there. <laughs> oh, what was the decision? Like, where did you say, all right, it's time for me to wrap up and move on and do something else? You know, I kind of felt like that from the very beginning. You know, again, I had some hesitation when I went there, um, and I wasn't sure if that was something that would be a perfect fit for me. I, I did not like to travel at all. I mean, I'm a, I'm a homebody. I like home. Uh, you know, I grew up in Connecticut. I'm still in Connecticut, but I was not a traveler. And all of a sudden, I'm traveling every three days, you know, from um, Arizona to St. Louis to Atlanta to, you know, and it's like I felt – very uncomfortable living out of a suitcase. Um, I got married in 2008. Um, you know, we had, we bought a house. I mean, all those things started to like pull on me like, okay, this is getting crazy, you know? Um, and I felt like I had established myself enough in those three years there and established the relationships with the players, other coaches, other strength coaches that if I decided to go out on my own, um, that I could, I could do something. And and I felt confident that I could use the, the, uh, my time, and what I learned with those guys to to do something new. So I think it was when I felt comfortable enough, you know, in, in that that it sort of made the decision easier. And also when I knew that I could still maintain those relationships and I didn't have to be in there to be able to have those relationships with those guys. I could still have the relationships without having to be there all the time. Okay, so once you finally did wrap up and you were leaving there, what was, like, what did you do next for, you know, 
income, business. I mean, you still had the personal, the physical therapy yeah. stuff, but what else? So basically, that was um, at the end of uh, 2008, like October of 2008 or so. Mm -hmm. And um, I had started, I think, you know, I, I alluded to the fact that I liked golf a long time ago. Now, yeah. uh, one of one of my um, one of my sort of inspirations for what was going on online and the, the ability to to sort of reach more people online was what was what Ryan Lee had done, um, uh, uh, you know, and sort of showing the the six figure trainer. I think was what he said. You know, you can become a trainer. And you can utilize the internet to sort of get get more people to benefit from what you were doing. I thought that was a cool idea, and, and I actually tried an uh, uh, an information product on golf back in two thousand one or two or so. And actually, you know, it made a couple sales. And when I look back at what I did though now, I I laugh because I completely didn't have the uh, um, the right approach at all to what I was, you know, what I was doing. I didn't, right. I didn't have an email list. I didn't, you know, I, I didn't know any of that stuff. I was just sort of picking up bits and pieces because again, I was trying to juggle building a, a, a private practice, um, with the internet stuff sprinkled in, you know, and I don't think it's either, I don't think it's a great idea. I think, like I said, the best thing I ever did was taking those two days completely off so that I could build something else and, it, and you're going to start pretty lonely but you're going to be able to build well in 2008 i kind of applied that same thinking like i'm going to take some people back to train because i want to get some income coming in again that's important but i don't want to overwhelm myself with training i am not going back to training like i was before seven days a week because then nothing new will come out of this i will have gone to the mets spent three years there and nothing will have changed from when right. i before i left there'll be nothing more i mean maybe, maybe you could you know your your uh, your rates would be higher, but I mean it's not nothing would have changed for me from a, a, a direction of, of my career. So um, I left a lot of that time open, and um, I dedicated myself to wanting to learn everything I could about getting out there and, and doing something new, especially online. So um, in I think it was like March, the following you know the following March, I went to. Uh, um, a workshop that that Ryan had um, hosted here. He's in Norwalk, Connecticut himself, so it's like right here in my backyard. And I thought it'd be a great opportunity um, to learn and to give me sort of a kickstart too um, as to what I needed to really focus on. And um, the whole concept behind that was, you know, leave this workshop with something um, that you can sort of hang your hat on. And I, uh, I had been doing some uh, ba a baseball uh, manual that I had been putting together while I was with the Mets. Um, so that was my first info product I really had that I could do. Because of that, um, Ryan had invited Paul Reddick, who I think you've interviewed before. And Paul and I hit it off right away. I mean, he was interested in the product. He was interested in me. Um, we really became great friends uh, through there. And we sort of launched this whole new partnership for our baseball training products that you know, it did extremely well. And I think the reason why it worked so well is because of how good friends we became. You know, we trusted each other. We, you know, uh, we were sitting in there, you know, opening up a bank account together like like husband and wife for crying out loud. You know, <laughs> we, uh, you know, <laughs> it was like, you know, but we didn't care. We trusted each other and we did it and it's worked out phenomenally. You know, and we, we just, we, we, you know, I couldn't be more thankful. But really what he did was he helped me a lot and just making connections, um, He's the guy that can, you know, talk about doing one little thing a day. I mean, this is a guy that lives doing the same thing, and he's willing to do it for other people. He's willing to help other people make those same connections and do those small things each day. So he only sort of furthered what I already tried to do all the time anyway, which is do, to do the little things. Um, and and that was that. And But sort of backtracking in that, in that um, workshop that we did, um, that was the development of Athlean X, where I said, you know, I love baseball. I love training baseball players, um, but I do write for men's fitness. I have a bigger appeal than just baseball players. I have an appeal to just guys that want to look more athletic, that want to feel more athletic, um, and I've trained athletes. So I, I think this is a great fit for me to come up with a program that I can actually develop and allow guys to train that way. And that was it. And that was the day that I sort of created that uh, the, the, the initial seed of Athlean X. has undergone many revisions and you know mm -hmm. changes through the, the the two years that it's been um out just continually trying to grow it and get and get bigger and better but um okay. that was where it started so you had created it and were working on it before you met paul um the, the concept was in my head yeah i okay. i that was when i showed up to that <laughs> workshop it was not to work on the baseball mm -hmm. stuff because i already felt like hey I, I already have this done i mean i have mm -hmm. this 
it's already printed up. It's in a manual. It's done. I mean, when, when Paul was at that, um, that workshop, I actually handed in the manual and said, here you go, look at it. I mean, it was already done. It was just that we took that, the concepts behind that and the concepts he had for baseball training and we put them together and did something different. Okay. Um, but yeah, the, the concept, the, the, the workshop was really focused on me developing and building out this athlete next, um, you know, uh, product line. Um, and you know, and I think it's important to say really when I showed up and this is something we can go down, down into now if, if you'd like, but when I showed up there, I showed up there with the idea of creating a brand, not creating a product to leave there with 48 hours later. You know, I was me. I, I knew from the very start, I want to create a brand. And I think it's very important to, ter- depending upon what your goals are online, some guys just want to, you know, get a product, make some, make some money and then move on to something different, maybe an entirely different niche and then, mm-hmm. you know, make money in that and then move on. And, but for me, I feel like, you know, it's always been something like, I, again, as an entrepreneur, I want to grow something and build something. And for me, I always wanted to build a brand that I could stand behind. That would be the brand of how I feel um, I could help people through training, you know, and especially the guys are saying, I want to look like that guy. I want to look like that athlete. I want, what, could, what kind of training could I put together that would allow a guy to, to look like that, but also build in this whole concept of brand and team. And I know at the, uh, at uh, Ryan's conference, um, Tim Schmidt talked about associations and stuff and how people sort of become part of an association. It's such an important feeling. You know, that's why brands, when they're done right, will succeed because you feel good. You know, I love going to Starbucks, you know, just, I just like right. walking to Starbucks, you know, I, I hated coffee before I got into baseball too. I just got in, into coffee so I could keep my eyes open after that schedule. <laughs> but like, I don't know, that was the one I gravitated towards because that was the one that was in every city, you know, that I went to. So yeah, I, mean, I, might, I might as well have just gotten hooked on Dunkin' Donuts. It's not like the coffee itself. It's just the, it's just the brand and the feeling. So I think whenever you can create brand and what you do, um, you are light years ahead of everybody else. Right. Now, what I want to dive into, um, because you went to the conference and that's where you, you had met Paul. Did you just go mm-hmm. straight up to him and say, hey, listen, you know, well, I'm so-and-so. Here's my product. Or were you introduced to him? Um, what was that? No. No, uh, Ryan, I think the way the story went was that Ryan knew that he was going to have me there um, because it was, remember, this is a small workshop. This is only like five people, I think okay. it was, and he was helping five people develop you know, their ideas. And he invited uh, Paul himself because I believe Paul was going through the area somehow, go, uh, through somewhere in Connecticut. He's going to be on the way back, but he had reached out to Paul knowing he's a baseball guy saying, hey, just so you know, I'm having this workshop be great if you could stop by. I got a baseball guy coming. He used to work with the Mets. He might be, he might be interested in meeting him. You know, he might have a good something that you guys could work together on. So that's how it went. Um, so Paul and Paul, I remember he was a stud when he was there and he was helping everybody, you know, with, with uh, great ideas. He, I know he does some, you know, really good copywriting for himself and everything. So he was helping guys come up with headlines and copywriting and, mm-hmm. and, um, he, but he, his, his, his really purpose for being there was to uh, be introduced to me and meet me. So, um, yeah, as soon as he got there, we, we, uh, we met up, talked, and that was that. I mean, it, it, the connections that you make with other people can't, especially in this kind of, uh, you, know, uh, I- you know, internet delivery of products and stuff is like, it can't be understated, you know, because it's so powerful to be able to, I mean, here we are having an interview. I don't know, where, where you're, are you in uh, New York right now? Yep. Yeah, I mean, it's not like we're that far away, but it, you know, you could, you might as well be in San Francisco right now. We could be doing mm-hmm. the same thing, you know. So, um, that that element to what we do is is huge, and and Paul was very generous in, in getting me to meet not only himself but other people too. Okay, and I want to dive into actually being, you know, business partners with somebody. You said it was important, you know, works well because you've become friends. But when it comes to partnerships, especially maybe online where you're not seeing each other all the time or you know, face to face in an office. What is it that makes a partnership work and, and make it successful? Trust. You know, you have to trust uh, your your partner. I mean, um, again, it sounds like I'm talking about marriage here, but it's like you know, there's <laughs> very there's a lot of parallels here to to marriage and yeah. uh, and business. You, you know, you have to trust that not only uh, is the business going to thrive if you both do things that you're good at. You know, you should always bring your best elements to the table and then back off where you feel like maybe you're not as good so you can let the other person take the show. Um, and then also trust in that um, the business is better because the both of you are putting in that effort. So 
you don't want to let the other person down. They don't want to let you down. It sort of it, it sort of makes the, the the whole concept thrive. I think so. You know, and then and then down to the whole you know obvious uh, part of the equation where you have to trust the money in, money out. You know how it's being distributed and what it's being spent on, and and uh, you know whether you agree with how you know how you, whether it's advertising dollars where you're allocating the, these you know these monies. You want to make sure that everybody's on the same board. You know, and I think that. You know, uh, I think that that's a, a, an important thing that a lot of times makes people stumble, you know, um, and, and brings down a lot of good partnerships because you don't have the same philosophy on, on how to uh, on, on how to deliver your ideas. But we, we're just lucky that we did. I don't know why, what it was that mm -hmm. why we did agree like that, but I think just Paul and I are pretty similar that way. We, we feel like there's sometimes when you have to take a step back for the betterment of the business, like, you know, we would we sort of would um, – disappear and not not release a product for a year because we felt like maybe we're releasing too many you know at this point so um you know and that's you got to be able to, to agree on, on that and um i just think it's trust and sort of everybody realizing that if you're pulling for the same end goal it's always going to be it's always going to be a good thing and like i said letting people do we'll talk about something about delegation if you want in a second sure. i know paul and i the same way about this too when you're building a business but at this stage of the game, it was letting the people that do their their um, their part the best let them do it, you know, because that allows you to focus on what you do the best, and everybody brings their best to the table, and I think that's a key a key thing. Well, speaking of that, what was it that in terms? I mean, you were pretty new to the online internet game. What was it that you brought to the table um, that maybe Paul didn't have? Um, I think it was. I don't know if it was that something that Paul didn't have. I think. Um, what happened when Paul and I got together was that the uh, the ideas that we bounced off of each other. You know, there, I don't think Paul had somebody to bounce the ideas that that we wound up eventually launching mm -hmm. off of anybody. So that when he, when him and I are in a room together, we could put together a you know a, 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 a really cool idea um, in a short period of time because it would start with him just bringing up something. And I go, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, what about if we did this? And he's like, yeah. Well, what if we did this? And it would sort of go back and forth and it became greater than what it was. So I think what I, I was sort of like uh, the Robin to his Batman, you know, I would just uh, <laughs> be there to, to, to absorb the idea and then maybe throw it back, back with some other twist onto it. And that was a, 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 you know, a key point for our development, you know, and I think um, it, just from, from a, a standpoint of the technical know-how though, I didn't know anything about, about the, uh, the business, but that brings me to my next point in that I have made it a point through to the two years of Athlete X to learn everything and do everything with the business. You know, people will say, we, we've heard people say at, at different conferences and stuff, um, you know, delegate to, you know, outsource, 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 you know. And I am a complete believer in outsourcing only after you've learned yourself how to do everything. You know, I'm talking about I can code uh, websites, I can design websites, I can use uh, Photoshop to do banners and my own banners. I can do, uh, um, you, know, uh, what, what, uh, you know, anything from, you know, writing the email, sending the emails out, you know, the, uh, any of that, you know, membership site, anything that has to be done, I did and I learned myself, struggled badly through um, customer service, everything. Because now when I want to delegate customer service, uh, which we have, I know every question that's going to come in, and I know every way that you should be that they should be handled, you know. And I can tell somebody much quicker. Look, okay, this is going to be the response. You should, you know, do this for your answer, or provide this for your answer. Make sure you say this too, because it's going to keep them happy. Everybody should be happy. Um, you know, if I hadn't done all that, if I had outsourced right away, I wouldn't know what to expect. I wouldn't know how to handle people. I wouldn't know how to handle my customers. I also wouldn't know what my customers want, because I wouldn't see the requests that came in every day. Um, if I didn't know anything about Photoshop or um, fixing something that goes wrong on my website, you know, and I got to look around panicked trying to find somebody because, you know, there's something wrong on my website and I can't take an order or I can't take, uh, you know, the page isn't showing. I mean, not only are you subject to getting, you know, ripped off by people that know that you don't know and they know that you need to have it up in two seconds from now, but you you just feel kind of powerless you know so i right. tried to educate myself on i'm not good at everything by any means i just got good enough at everything you know 
to be able to handle myself and fix the things that are going wrong until I can now get it off to a qualified person to take care of it. But I truly believe that the best way to start is to try to learn every aspect of your, um, of your site, of your business online so that you know what's going on. And you also know when you're delegating to other people, when it's being done the way that you like it to be done. And also, you know, when things go wrong. Okay. Now so. we've talked about a little bit about Athlean X. Can you just for people watching, explain exactly what it is. Oh, Athlete X is a, it's a 90 day training program that was uh, really developed from uh, my experiences training professional athletes and what it was that sort of shocked me about them um, that gets them to look the way they do. I mean, I think I went into uh, the, the New York Mets thinking that these guys, like many other guys, do they have um, that they train all day long? You know, they work out for two hours. Like, because what do they what do they do otherwise? They play a game at seven o'clock at night. Like, yeah. what would they do otherwise? You know, and I couldn't be more uh, more wrong. I mean, these guys are um, machines when it comes to preparation, but they don't work that long. They don't you know overtrain because that's the, the the quickest way to you know kill their performance is overtraining. And I learned that rest and recovery was a huge you know uh, benefit to keeping somebody not only um, progressing, but from, you know, from regressing to the point where they can't get, make any more progress that would kill a professional athlete. So as I watched and observed and started to take these guys through and train them, um, I learned that this could actually be really beneficial to guys that were wondering, Hey, how can I look like those guys? How can I start, you know, applying that athleticism and, you know, how they can move and stuff like that to what it is that I do. And I, and I saw a lot of the programs that were out there, just didn't really offer that type of experience for a guy. Um, you know, it's the same old, you know, tricep push downs into, you know, dips into the, it's just like, if I see that again, it's going to, you know, make me, you know, cry. You know, it's just, there's just too much of it. So, um, from a, having a physical therapist background too, I was able to really combine a lot of the movement patterns, um, in unique ways. I could still accomplish the same thing, but keep it fresh because that's the other thing that the pro athletes they get bored if you do it they want challenge they want challenge they want so how can we make a workout that incorporated fresh ideas um, short and intense but also had built in challenges to it so that you always felt like you were competing against yourself because it becomes more interesting guys like to be challenged and like to be you know like to rise to the to the challenge that's what Athlean X was that's what we sort of put out there. And it's been a, a, a great success since then because I think it's really appealed to the, the way that guys like to train. All right. So once you had the, the program, the model, you know, in line, what did you start to do to market it to get it out there so that, you know, people were going to start buying it? Yeah. I mean, I feel like that, that that's always the big, the big, uh, you know, um, little problem that, that, that gets everybody, you know, uh, snagged and, and put on hold because they – you could have the greatest idea. If nobody sees it, it's not it's not going to do anything for you. And you know, I I started with uh, I didn't have the, the 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 resources to start buying traffic. I didn't have the confidence in the program initially to start buying traffic. Although that is the quickest way to get people to your site. And I think you know, looking at it now, if I was going to test something right now, I would probably just buy traffic and see how how it converted. You know, but back then. I just wanted again with the with the concept of building a brand. I didn't care if the time investment was longer than I would have wished, if as long as it was growing. So I went to YouTube and I figured, you know, what I do is a very visual thing anyway. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I have a, a it's a fitness is a visual, you know, visual uh, skill that needs to be demonstrated so people can see it and feel as if they're, you know, they're they're learning from watching and then learning by doing. You know, and. I put up a couple of videos and, you know, I laugh at the first couple that I put up. I was completely not comfortable on camera. Um, I, not that I'm a, a polished uh, presenter at this point in time, but I, I, I was not, you know, comfortable at all. And the, you know, the view count was horrendous. I mean, I would put a video up and, you know, I think a week later I'd have like nine views and I know at least two of them were from probably Paul and, you know, my father or something, you know, so right. it may be my wife saw one of them or so, but I mean, there were no views, but I think that's where most people would just give up because they'd be like, well, look, this is not, this is not working. I'm putting videos up. Nobody's finding them. It's sort of ridiculous. And I, I'm not going to go through the time or the embarrassment of putting myself up here because I don't feel comfortable doing it anyway. 
but I knew that the, the concept was good. And I knew that the, um, um, I knew that the, that if I stayed with it, it would become bigger than, you know, uh, than it had been at that time. So I just kept doing it. And I, and I, I only did one video a week. I have people telling me do, do three videos, four videos a week, you know, saturate the YouTube. A lot. You can't saturate YouTube with your stuff. I think there's 85,000 videos that are done that are uh, published every day or something like that. I mean, you know, you are not going to saturate YouTube with your videos. So, um, you know, put up good content, worry about maybe cutting back and doing one thing right. Um, you know, instead of trying to just put up four videos that are moderately interesting. So that's what I did. I figured, let me just, I can, I can develop good content, um, each week, once a week, if I stick with that model. Again, it took a longer time to develop. But it was always good content, which got people to like the brand again. You know, like they they, they knew that if they came there, they're not going to get a mm-hmm. um, they're not going to get a, a a bad video. You know, that they're going to always get a good stuff, something that they can rely on from me. And that was uh, that was it. So I, I sort of uh, um, did that, and slowly the nine views would become two hundred after a week, and it would become a thousand after a week, and you know, now we've got some videos that are touching a million uh, views. And if I put up a video now, it generally gets, you know, yeah. 10,000 views within a day or so. Yeah, because you have, I was checking, you have over nine and a half million views total for, for all yeah. your videos, which is really good. Was there anything that you did specific to try and increase your views or was it just continually putting those out every week? Um, it was just continually putting them out. I mean, I, I hit a couple um, um, bigger videos, like I said, like some that touching a million. Mm-hmm just because they were they were sort of in that niche that people were looking for you know like I think one of them is a chest workout you know every guy wants to get a big chest and it just so happened to go out and get become a bigger video I have one on uh, tricep training and and, you know that's a bigger one too but um, no it was just it was sort of that you know people would find um, one of those videos and then that starts to bring you into other videos also Mm -hmm. you know Um, but I just think that for me it was really concentrating on um, unique content each time I each time I deliver something, and it's not it's not always easy. I mean, I, I, I it, they don't yeah. always come to me, you know, right away. So, but that's why I like a week I, I, because I have a week to think about. It. I don't think about it three minutes before I go film the video. I think about it, you know, four days, five days before I go to the video. Or sometimes I'm already thinking about next week's when I'm filming this week's, you know. And I think that just allows me to keep it. Uh, at a high level so knowing that if people did find the video again remember if they do find it because sometimes someone's going to randomly find it if they find it and they like it you might get a subscriber you might get someone that stays on and wants to watch your other stuff and that's all it's about is just getting them you know getting them hooked with that one video so they say you know i like what this guy does um if you're just trying to sell a one-time thing real quick you might just go throw out a whole bunch of videos see if you can get someone's attention you know with those videos and then move on to the next thing but I you know I think it and that may be fine there's a lot of people I, I even know people that do that that just likes like to make money online and try to bounce around from niche to niche you know mm-hmm. but if you if that's what you define what you want to do it completely changes I, my information here would be of no importance it wouldn't it right. wouldn't help anybody you know but if you're trying to build a brand and build up a long-term presence then this is more the approach that I would suggest now, there are certain types of videos that you noticed that worked better better than others. Like you said, you know, chest workouts, maybe some ab workouts. And did you, once you realized it, did you start gearing videos more towards that? You know, I'm stubborn, you know. <laughs> I uh, One of my bad traits is that I'm stubborn. I've had people, you know, uh, from time to time complain about the length of my intro, you know, on my, on my videos. But, uh, you know, they got longer and longer as they were complaining. I uh, think this is really the direction I went. But, no, I wasn't doing it to aggravate anybody. I just did it for branding purposes. I like my mm-hmm. intro. The intro leads into the brand. It's sort of, you know, and, you know, it's not unlike a TV show that if you're watching a TV show, sure, we'd all like to get right into the content. But they don't just get right into the content without playing their, their bumper in the beginning of the, of the TV show, you know. Right. Some of them actually do now. They start right in at the content, and then they come back and play their bumper. But... No, I, I think it's just a matter of, um, uh, y- you know, going with my gut and feeling like what I feel could benefit someone that week. I mean, I've done, um, what was a, um, I did a hamstring video. I did something about like, you know, healthy knees, you know, I know that could benefit people out there. Now they're not the most searched terms on YouTube, you know, and knee, you know, keeping your knees healthy. I mean, people don't care until their knees are hurting them, you know? Right. I know that it can help. So I did a video on it. Now, 
if I was concerned only with um, creating content that's going to get a lot of views, then I would never leave the ones that have 700,000 views. I would always do chess videos. I would always do, you know, uh, arm videos and stuff like mm -hmm. that. I don't think, again, when you're looking at building a brand and building long term, you know, um, a, a long term presence, you can't just go based upon what they always, you know, are, are catering to. You have to go with what your gut tells you will, will provide a better program overall. And my, my gut tells me that, you know, there are guys out there. And that's the funny thing. Sometimes when I start doing a little bit of like the PT talk in those videos, which I try to stay away from a lot of times because I don't want to make it like I'm talking at people and telling them that, you know, you know, giving them all the sciencey stuff behind behind the scenes. But whenever I sort of digress and go down that road, the comments and feedback are always that they love it, that they that they love that that I'm explaining to them why something works the way it does or why this is not the right way to do an exercise and this would make it better. And I feel like, um, you know, that reinforces to me that, yeah, that knee video might have helped, you know, mm -hmm. only – a thousand people, whereas there was seven hundred thousand people that liked the the chess video, you know. But right. those thousand people, they may go tell a thousand of their friends because they 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 helped them so much. So now I just pulled in more more people to my circle anyway. You know, the other people that saw the video of, of the chess might not have told anybody because they just they like it, they did it. But I might have changed someone's life a little bit with the with the knee video so that they're going to tell more people. So you can never you can never just judge things based upon what the uh, immediate results are. Because you're always going to have all these other things that are happening behind the scenes, you know. It's like if someone were to be on your email list and they were to, you know, they were to um, come on but not not convert into a sale right away, right? You, you get a lead but they're not a sale. Well, who's to say that something down the ro the road or something that you did, maybe a blog post you did somewhere else, didn't convert them into a lead down the line? You know, I mean, into a sale down the line. You 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 don't know. You're just looking to get them in and you're hoping that at some point in time they're gonna they're gonna you know they're gonna like what they see from you. I can't tell you how many people I've had that um that are on my list that eventually buy sometimes a year. I had a guy tell me he's been following me since I started two years ago. He just bought the program. Wow. Now Paul Paul believes in um uh, basically a concept with his emails of mailing every day and either they're gonna become customers or they're gonna unsubscribe. You know, and it's a it's a it's a really smart way to think of it because, you know, you're paying for those people to be on your list anyway. You know, um, through whatever service you're using, right. uh, and if they're just gonna be there and never, you know, never purchase anything from you, um, they're not of value to Paul really because they're just sitting there. You know, so he would if when you know, he emails, he wants them to either convert or not. Um, I, for me, like I said, I found out that for me, it doesn't work that way. I, I have guys that will literally sit and watch and read and look and, you know, for months and then finally say, I really like the stuff you've been giving me. So, you know, I'm going to uh, purchase the program. So, you know, it depends on how you're, you know, how you view your, um, your business and how you think that what will work best for you, you know, and, and, but I, I think there's different ways to look at it. Okay. One of the other things is an interesting topic and, I see it more and more. I mean, we're doing this video. I'm very visual with a lot of things. When you started marketing using YouTube, did you have any issues? Were you uncomfortable with being on camera? Uh, were you always comfortable with it? How did you feel no, when you first I, did I, it? I, I hated it at first, you know. Okay. And uh, the uh, the the funny thing was, I just I, I didn't I could feel myself talking to millions of people, you know. <laughs> so <laughs> when I even though I'm talking to just the camera. I could feel like I was talking to many more, and right. that's just mindset. That because really you are okay. not talking to me; you are talking to one camera. That's it. So if you can put yourself at ease and uh, put yourself in a in a um, in a scenario where you are as comfortable as you can be, uh, whether it's what you're doing now, sitting in front of the computer in an office, feeling comfortable, if that's what makes you feel most relaxed. Now, this video might go out and have millions of people watching it, but you're not thinking that. You're just thinking, I'm comfortable in my office. I'm mm -hmm. talking to Jeff. I would always suggest to people, try to put yourself in the most comfortable environment but and, 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 and get those thoughts out of your head that you're, that you're going to be seen by somebody and they're going to be judging you. And Because believe me, guys are going to judge you. And they mm -hmm. are going to – I get haters all the time. You know, they'll judge. But it's funny because your people that like you usually come to your defense anyway and they, they right. squash those guys right away. So – you know, it's actually entertaining to sort of watch some of the stuff that happens, but um, it just comes through practice. Now, we just started a, a woman's program um, the uh, two weeks ago, and 
it's done really, really well so far. And, um, you know, the woman that does is sort of the equivalent of me for that product. She's the, the front person for that product. She doesn't, you know, she's, she's a, she's actually, she's a, a, a an instructor at a gym, like a class instructor, group class instructor. So she is phenomenal when she's in front of um, her classes. She's so motivating. She's so encouraging. She's so uh, energetic and driving, you know, right. but when she gets in front of the camera first couple of times on, on her YouTube videos, she's, she's nervous and she, she's thinking mm -hmm. about it as far as lines, you know, she's like, Oh, I got to think of, Oh, I should have said that. Oh, I should say, you know, um, you know, toned biceps instead of like, let's train your biceps. Like it's, and she's thinking too much. And I said, no, right. no, 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 no. If, if one of your clients came up to you right now in the gym, in one of your classes and said, Hey, what can I do for my arms? That's the answer you should give to her. The answer that you're going to put on camera right now should be the answer you would give to her because people are going to like the fact that you're real. You're talking to real people. They want, they want to feel like they're talking to a real person with you. And that's going to be the answer that comes out the smoothest. Once you start trying to think about lines, you're going to be, you're going to be screwed. So, you know, even filming my initial videos, Paul helped me film my initial videos for my website. Wait, when it first came out, mm -hmm. man, we must've taken this one 30 second video, like 40 times to try to get it right. And I screwed up every time I couldn't do it. So it's practice makes perfect for sure. You know, and I think you just start to feel more comfortable in your own skin. And, you know, as the message gets out there and people start to, give you feedback and you're reassured that they like what you're doing, you start to feel more confident that, you know, the message you're delivering is, is a good one. So you, you st I think you, that starts to come through in your, in your uh, presentations, you know? Okay. And now, you know, you've had a number of products with Paul. Mm -hmm. When you guys go to develop or create a new product, uh, is it based off of demand? Or, I mean, are you just creating, are you surveying people? How are you figuring out what's going to work? You know, I usually let uh, Paul, you know, take care of sort of that because he, okay. his list is, is the, um, you know, is, is enormous and he's very much in touch with that, with that list. He does do, he okay. does do, uh, surveys through the list. Okay. Um, and they've gotten some information from, from, you know, from the surveys that way. But I think what we do, um, generally is we use that as a way to guide us a little bit, but I think we try to think, okay, what have we done so far and what could we do that would either complement that in a way that hasn't been done or completely different that guys would love. You know, we, we did the um, uh, product not too long ago. It's actually the last product we did was uh, uh, band training for baseball. Um, and we hooked up with uh, Dave Schmitz to do, uh, you know, band training. It was a really cool, unique concept. Like, I mean, you know, the fact that bands can be brought anywhere, they're, they're you know, easily traveled uh, with. You can, you can um, hook them up in any location, pretty much. You could do partner, you know, work with the bands. It's a it's a unique thing in the three dimensional. So right. you know you can you know work all the planes that you would in baseball. It was kind of a cool concept, and I think um, it took off and it did really well because um, we just felt like it wasn't something that really had been addressed uh, in a in a major way to that point. So I always like those are my favorite kind of products. Doing something that sort of appeals to people in a way that they didn't really initially initially realize. So. You can't always rely on surveys because surveys will just tell you what people are aware of that are out there. If the if uh, Apple only relied on surveys, they would never create the whole like these brand new concepts that they come mm -hmm. up with all the time. You know that that are like, oh my god, I never thought about that. You know, right. and then you realize how much you need the iPad or something. You know, after they right. develop, right. you're like, oh, I guess my laptop wasn't good enough. You know, right. or I guess the iPhone wasn't good enough. So now they come up with something completely different, and you're like, oh man, I really need that. So. I think those are the best and most fun ways to come up with things is, you know, show people that it's something really cool that they could use that they never thought they could before. One of the other topics that I want to cover, I haven't really gotten into in too many of the interviews, is the customer service side of things for, mm -hmm. let's say, info products. How important is that? Oh, my God. I mean, uh, again, we, I, I'm, I'm glad to have uh, outsourced that you know, now, but... Um, God, even in the beginning when there was just a, a few customers, you know, they, they, well, let's go back. I mean, there's people that will write in that are interested in your product that all they want to know is that there's someone real on the other side that's waiting to respond to their question. I can't tell you how many times someone will write in and say, you know, I'm considering your product, but I was wondering, you know, I, I generally, I'm a thinner guy. 
And I noticed that, you know, some of the guys that, that have done the program already have lost um, considerable amounts of fat, you know, but would it work for a guy that's already skinny that's trying to add muscle? You know, first of all, you have the ability to explain to them that it, that it, it can work, you know, because it, that, that is one of the cool things about Athlean X is that you can build muscle and burn fat at the same time. I've never believed, never in my life have I ever got fat so that I can get ripped. I mean, it's just, that's just so stupid. I don't you know. It's going to take a longer time. Don't get me wrong. You're gonna, you know, you're. It's gonna take you a longer time to get to where you need to be, but you're gonna get there steadily and consistently. So in the long run, it's actually gonna be shorter than it was before because you're not gonna be going back and forth. Well, just to get a response for that for that person on the other end to get a response and say, you know, yeah, hey, I know what you're saying. Um, we've had other guys that are hard gainers go through this program and actually add significant significant amounts of muscle and. If you have somebody now, we have plenty of guys that have done that, you know, in our testimonials. Now you can actually say, hey, you might not have seen this guy, but here's another guy that might be in your situation. Go take a look at just to be able to feed, give them some feedback and point that they buy like 90 percent of the time because they are just more confident that they're not getting ripped off or scam. Number one, that that they're not going to give their credit card and never hear from you again. You know, Mm -hmm. and number two, that you actually cared about whether or not they purchased a program or not. You gave them some decent information back. You know, you could tell them something of value that they can take with themselves, even if they decided not to buy from you. And that's something that we've strived to do, um, you know, forever. That's what I did initially myself. And now I tell my guys to do for me now. And I think if you don't do that, you lose a lot, a lot of potential sales and revenue because guys just say, ah, not in here from now. I'm going to the next one. Or I could tell you, I won't mention the names, but I wrote to so-and-so and they never wrote back. Mm-hmm. Or I wrote to this other person, I never back. I'm just trying to get an answer to this question. And then you answer the question and they buy it from you. So customer service, enormous. I mean, and then from the post sale stuff, we actually have something I call the um the extra mile guarantee. You know, where we I I don't want guys to buy the program and then just leave and go away because for me it's beneficial to get testimonials. It's it's beneficial for me to get guys that are actually gonna rave about it, love being part of Athlean X. Love, we call it Team Athlean. You know, love being part of Team Athlean. Love being able to um, say that. Yeah, I was having a you know uh, a tough time with one of the exercises. I wrote in. They told me how to do it, you know how to do it, or they told me a substitution for it. You know, so now they feel like they've got a trainer in their corner too. And how is it not going to benefit me? As long as I have my guys that can answer those questions for me, how does it not benefit me to make sure that the guy does the program correctly, so that when at the end of the ninety days, I've got the best testimonial I can get mm-hmm. from somebody. And a raving fan that's going to go out and tell everybody else. So if you've got the time and the ability to do it, customer service is a huge por- portion of uh, building a brand. You know, because you can build you can build your own army of guys that love your stuff and your own army of successful people that have sort of graduated or gone through your program. Very cool. Now I want to know. You know, you've been at it online just for really a short time, just a couple of years doing it, but you've, you've been very successful with it. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm sure since you've been moving so fast through it, you've probably made quite a few mistakes. <laughs> um, what's one of the biggest mistakes that you've made? Um, God, I, I am the, my wife would tell you in a second, I am the biggest, uh, jump, you know, head first into everything, you know, kind of guy. Yeah. Cause I'm, a, I, my, my brain gets going and I have a lot of great and cool ideas. I mean, I have sites that I that I needed designed for me, you know, um, within, you know, days. Like I was like, no, no, I need it. No, I need it Friday. I need to have it. I need to have it. <laughs> they have not even been. They haven't seen the light of day, and you know, this has been eight months now. You know, they mm-hmm. haven't seen the light of day, and there's no immediate plans for their their release either. You know, I I definitely tend to get excited by an idea. I jump into it. Um, I try to get it all developed. Now, the cool thing for me, I feel, is if when I'm ready for that idea, it's already kind of has a big head start. So that when I turn my attention to it, it's already got a good, cool site design. But what also happens with me is that, you know, as I continue to evolve and change and see different ways that I, I would like to present something, you know, what I had initially designed doesn't really work for me anymore either. You know, so mm-hmm. I wasted a lot of money on um, um, things that I initially thought I wanted to do. I even had a book that I was really started to, to write. Um, long time ago I have the cover of the book already designed <laughs> I have like the first chapter of the book done but that thing ain't getting written until you know I can guarantee you for another year or two because I just don't have the time to do it um, but I remember driving that designer crazy to get that book cover done 
you know, <laughs> in time for my release five years from now. <laughs> so I don't know. I, I, I think my biggest mistake is sometimes, um, you know, lack of, uh, lack of a clear focus, you know? And okay. I think that the, the, when I, when I tend to focus, I do better. The only thing is other aspects of the business start to pile up a little bit, you know, because you, you if you do decide to get so focused on one thing, um, you can't keep dabbling into a million different things. You know, you have to kind of keep that focus there. And, you know, it does leave open some uh, room for, um, you know, for backup. But, you know, I always feel like it's better to complete that, though, than to have six things that are 80% done. It's better to have five things that are 80% done and one thing that's actually done and then four things that are 80% and then two things are actually done and to keep going in that way, you know, it starts to free up your mind a little bit more and you can start to be more creative, you, you know, instead of, once you have six things open, partially done, your creativity funnel starts to close down because you're like, I know, but it's all I need is another idea. All I need to do is start down another yeah. path and sometimes it's the best one because that might be the best path of all six, but you shut it down because you don't want to take on any extra work, you know, so, right. I would always say try to stay as focused as possible and you know it's never a bad thing to jump in but realize that if you are the type if you are like me and you do that often it, it's uh it, you know it could hold you back a little bit what have been a few of the biggest keys to your success in business so far um definitely um communications with like i said making connections with other people um uh i don't care how big you get i don't care at what level, if you become a $100 million company, a billion dollar company, um, you can continue to make connections that can benefit your business and, and make for strong, um, you know, a stronger business of your own. You know, just by association with other strong businesses, you can learn some cool things that they're doing mm -hmm. that you could apply to your own. You can learn just ta tactics that they use to sort of uh, become more, um, uh, more fluent with what they do, or, you know, make it a smoother mo moving process for your business, you know. Um, anything or just even from an idea standpoint but you can definitely learn from others and um, and make great partnerships that's probably the biggest key that you can you could do and then I think secondly like I said from the beginning learn what learn the elements of your business you know learn not just what you think um, you can do you're gonna find out what your strength is I told you how important it was to start when you do get into a partnership with somebody um, or even if it's your own business and you start to delegate, you know, learn the things that you do best. But the only way you're going to learn the thing that you do best is to do everything first, you know. And I think if you learn all the things, a little bit about everything, you start to. I, I can tell you right now, I can code, but I'm not a good coder. You know, I I uh, I can write copy, but I'm not the best copywriter. You know, not at all, not by any means. So I would I would I know that now, and I could more comfortably give those to uh, to other people. But do them all. Do them all first, and you'll find out what it is you're good at. So that when it comes time to focusing in on what you do, um, then you should you should spend the majority of your time there. Awesome, well, Jeff. Thank you so much for coming on and sharing all kinds of amazing information. Uh, where can other people go to check out more about what you're doing? Uh, I would say you know uh, head to athletex.com. We have uh, um, a lot of stuff going on there. We have a blog that we update pretty regularly. Um, that's just uh, a t h l e a n x uh, dot com. Um, my YouTube channel is uh, you know it's not the best uh, name. I got it when, when I didn't realize it was going to become as big as it is. So it's J D Cav J D C A V twenty four. Uh, YouTube doesn't allow you to change the name of that <laughs> of your user account after it's set up. So that's another good tip for you. Yeah, one of the bigger mistakes. If you know what you're going to do, uh, call your channel that in the beginning, uh, so you can have some relevance you know, later on. But um, it hasn't held us back from a, a standpoint of building up subscribers, but, um, you know, and uh, that's really it. And then for the, you know, the women's program, brand new is just Athlean XX for women. So, you know, we have sort of this, um, you know, one-two approach, whether you're a man or woman, where we can give you hopefully the best fitness information that you're looking for. Very cool, man. Well, thank you again. I appreciate it, and I wish you the best of luck with everything in the future. Thanks, Eric. I appreciate uh, the opportunity to be here. Oh, 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 oh,